Previously on World History and Geography. By the early 800 CE, small Anglo-Saxon kingdoms covered the former Roman province of Britain. In Europe, the decline of the Carolingian Empire in the 900s left a patchwork of feudal states controlled by local lords. Gradually, the growth of towns and villages and the breakup of the feudal system were leading to more centralized government and the development of nations. The earliest nations in Europe to develop a strong unified government were England and France. Both would take similar paths. And now, our feature presentation. For centuries, invaders from various regions in Europe landed on English shores. The Germanic Angles and the Saxons stayed, bringing their own ways and creating an Anglo-Saxon culture. In the 800s, Britain was battered by fierce raids of Vikings. Only Alfred the Great, Anglo-Saxon king from 871 to 899, managed to turn back the Viking invaders. There's so much more about Vikings that I want to find out! Gradually, he and his successors united the kingdom under one rule, calling it England or Land of the Angles, even though there were also Romans, Saxons, Jutes, and Celts on the island. Oh yeah, when talking about the people, the Celts are Celtic. When talking about the basketball or soccer teams, they're Celtic. Anyway, in 1016 CE, the Danish king Canute conquered England, molding Anglo-Saxons and Vikings into one people. In 1042, King Edward the Confessor, a descendant of Alfred the Great, took the throne. Edward died in January 1066 without a direct heir. A great struggle for the throne erupted. Harold Godwinson of Wessex took the throne, but two others claimed right to the English throne. The first, Harold of Norway, invaded but was killed by King Harold's forces. The second was William, Duke of Normandy. Normandy is a region in the north of France that had been conquered by the Vikings. Its name comes from the French term for the Vikings, Northmen or Norman. The Normans were descended from the Vikings, but they were French in language and in culture. As King Edward's cousin, William claimed the English crown and invaded England with a Norman army. On October 14th, 1066, 1066, Normans and Anglo-Saxons fought the battle that changed the course of English history, the Battle of Hastings. The Normans won a decisive victory after Harold was killed by an arrow that pierced his eye. At least that's what most people think, due to the bio tapestry which is not really a tapestry, but embroidered cloth, and wasn't made in Bayou France. Wait, why is it called the Bayou Tapestry again? Anyway, the 230-foot-long Bayou Tapestry depicts the events of William's invasion and the death of Harold Rex, or King Harold. I can't believe how much I'm learning. After his victory, William declared all of England as personal property and brought feudalism to England. William kept about one-fifth of England for himself, the English lords who supported the former king, Harold, lost their lands. William then granted their lands to about 200 Norman lords who swore oaths of loyalty to him personally. By doing this, William, now known as William the Conqueror, unified control of the lands and laid the foundation for centralized government in England. Over the next centuries, English kings tried to achieve two goals. First, they wanted to hold and add to their French lands. Second, they wanted to strengthen their own power over the nobles and the church. William the Conqueror's descendants owned land both in Normandy and in England. The English King Henry II added to these French holdings by marrying Eleanor of Aquitaine from France. Because Henry held lands in France, he was a vassal of the French king, but he was also a king in his own right. Anyway, Henry II ruled England from 1154 to 1189 CE. He strengthened the royal courts of justice by sending royal judges to every part of England at least once a year. They collected taxes, settled lawsuits, and punished crimes. Henry also introduced the use of the jury in English courts. A jury back then was different from what you think of today. In medieval England, a jury was a group of loyal people, usually 12 neighbors of the accused, who answered a royal judge's questions about the facts of a case. Jury trials became a popular means of settling disputes. Only the king's courts were allowed to conduct them. Over the centuries, case by case, the rulings of England's royal judges formed a unified body of law that became known as common law. Today, the principles of English common law are the basis for law in many English-speaking countries, including the United States. Henry II was succeeded first by his son, Richard the Lionhearted, hero of the Third Crusade. When Richard died on his way home from the Crusades, his younger brother John took the throne. You may remember John as Prince John from the story of Robin Hood. I am Robin Hood! You know, steal from the rich, give to the poor. I'll rob him of his gold and give it to some poor, unworthy slob. That'll prove that I'm Robin Hood. For all that bow and arrow stuff. Anyway, 
King John ruled from 1199 to 1216 CE. He failed as a military leader, earning the nickname John Soft Sword. John lost Normandy and all his lands in northern France to the French under King Philip Augustus. This loss and other problems forced a confrontation with his own nobles. Some of John's problems stem from his own personality. He alienated the Pope and the Church and threatened to take away town charters guaranteeing self-government. He was cruel to his subjects and tried to squeeze money out of them. John increased taxes to an all-time high to finance his wars, which he tended to lose. His nobles revolted. Finally, at Runnymede, Runnymede. On June 15, 1215 CE, the nobles forced John to agree to the most celebrated document in English history, the Magna Carta, which is Latin for Great Charter. This document, Magna Carta, drawn up by English nobles and reluctantly approved by King John, guaranteed certain basic political rights. The nobles wanted to safeguard their own feudal rights and limit the king's powers. In later years, however, English people of all classes argued that certain clauses in the Magna Carta applied to every citizen. Guaranteed rights included no taxation without representation, a jury trial, uh, you can't be thrown in jail for no reason, you can't have personal property taken from you for no reason, and the protection of the law. Rule of law. The underlying principle of the document is the idea that all must obey the law, even the king. The Magna Carta guaranteed what are now considered basic legal rights in England and in the United States. Another important step toward democratic government came during the rule of the English king Edward I. Edward needed to raise taxes for a war against the French, the Welsh, and the Scots. In 1295 CE, Edward summoned two burgesses, the free citizens of wealth and property, from every borough, and two knights from every county to serve as a parliament or legislative group. In November 1295 CE, knights, burgesses, bishops, and lords met together at Westminster in London. This is now called the Model Parliament because its new makeup, commoners or non-nobles, as well as lords, served as a model for later kings. Over the next century, from 1300 to 1400, the king called the knights and burgesses whenever a new tax was needed. In Parliament, the knights and burgesses gradually formed an assembly of their own called the House of Commons. Nobles and bishops met separately as the House of Lords. Under Edward I, Parliament was in part a royal tool that weakened the great lords. But as time went by, Parliament became strong. Like the Magna Carta, it provided a check on royal power. Meanwhile, down in France, King Philip IV, who ruled France from 1285 to 1314 CE, was involved in a quarrel with the Pope. In 1302, the Pope refused to allow priests to pay taxes to the king. Philip disputed the right of the Pope to control church affairs in his kingdom. As with England's parliament, the French king usually called a meeting of his lords and bishops when he needed support for his policies. To win wider support against the Pope, King Philip IV decided to include commoners in the meeting. In France, the church leaders were known as the first estate, or class, and the great lords were the second estate. The commoners, the wealthy landowners or merchants that Philip invited to participate in the council, became known as the third estate. The whole meeting was called the Estates General. Like the English Parliament in its early years, the Estates General helped to increase royal power against the nobility. Unlike Parliament, however, the Estates General never became an independent force that limited the king's power. However, centuries later, the Third Estate would play a key role in overthrowing the French monarchy during the French Revolution. But we'll get to that later. England and France were just beginning to establish a democratic tradition. This tradition rested on setting up a centralized government that would be able to govern widespread lands. The creation of common law and court systems was a first step toward increased central government power. Including commoners in decision-making process of government was also an important step in the direction of democratic rule. I'll rob him of his gold and give it to some poor unworthy slob. 